In 1959, Louis Leakey and his wife Mary changed the scientific vision of world history when they discovered the remains of an ancestral human who lived in Africa almost two million years ago. Since 1931, Leakey had been finding what he believed to be primitive stone tools at Olduvai. But it was the discovery of the fossilized bone with the chipped stones that proved human tool making extended back to an unbelievably distant past. The Leakeys got an age range of around 1.1 million years when they used an experimental dating method. Fission track dating was a new technique that tested radioactive decay in mineral crystals found in the layers of lava and volcanic ash overlying the bones and artifacts. In the same year, perhaps even the same field season, one of the great coincidences in archaeological science occurred on the other side of the globe. In 1959, Juan Armenta Camacho, a gifted amateur, discovered stone artifacts and fossilized animal bones that were eroding from the banks of the Valsequillo Reservoir in central Mexico. The finds from Africa and Mexico shared many similarities, but what subsequently happened with each discovery was dramatically different and remains one of the most intriguing episodes in archaeological history. Near the city of Puebla, about 70 miles east of Mexico City, a number of ancient volcanoes rise from the central plateau. The region was known to the Aztecs as a land of giants. When the Spanish began digging their foundations for their 17th century cathedrals, they had unearthed the bones of large mammals unlike anything they had ever seen. By the 1950s, Paleontologists had known for decades that the shores of the Valsequillo Reservoir were a rich source of Pleistocene fossils, the bones of large mammals that had lived in the region long ago but became extinct at the end of the last ice age. During the field season in 1959, Juan Armenta Camacho found the artifact that launched one of the New World's most controversial scientific mysteries. As he began to clean a fragment from an ancient mastodon bone, he discovered artwork. He saw the engraved images of several different animals that lived during the last ice age. It was possible that he was holding one of the oldest human artifacts found in the New World. Today, no one seems to know where this artifact is. At the time he found it, Armenta knew what a good scientist should do. He kept the artifact a secret, but began to invite preeminent specialists to verify the discovery. Microscopic studies of the engraving showed that the bone had been engraved when it was still fresh, what the paleontologists call green bone. This indicated that the artist worked soon after the animal was killed, and the artifact was not a recently drawn fake. But how old was it? In 1926, J.D. Figgins, who would eventually bring Marie Wormington to the Denver Museum, broke through the theoretical floor of the American archaeological past. He proved that humans had lived in the New World during the Ice Age, the time of the giant mammals. At a site in Folsom, New Mexico, he discovered a man-made spear point among the bones of an extinct bison antiques. At the time, scientists believed that humans first arrived in the New World about 4,000 years ago. With the discovery of the Ice Age American, human occupation was pushed back to a date which at the time researchers thought might range between 20 and 500,000 years ago. In 1926, no one knew how long ago the Ice Age actually occurred. About 25 years later, Willard Libby developed the technology of radiocarbon dating, which, combined with modern pollen analysis, told scientists that the last ice age and its megafauna started to vanish around 14,000 years ago. 
In the late 1950s, the new carbon dating technique was gaining wide acceptance, but Armenta quickly realized that he could not use it. His artifacts had been in the ground for so long that their chemical composition had changed from organic bone material to mineralized fossil, which contained no carbon compounds that could be tested by radiocarbon dating. Armenta recognized that, if authentic, this artifact could be the oldest artwork ever found in the New World. In an effort to authenticate this amazing find, Armenta enlisted help from paleontologists, professional artists, geologists, and archaeologists from all over the world. One of the first on the scene was famed paleo-Indian archaeologist Dr. Hannah Marie Warmington. After meeting with Armenta and examining his collection, she was convinced that the Valsakillo artifacts were an extremely important find. Meanwhile, word of the discovery leaked out to the press, and in the summer of 1960, Life magazine published a feature article about Armenta and his site. The now famous engraved mastodon bone was sent to the Smithsonian Institution for public display. On the same day the Life magazine article was published, Wormington wrote to her protege, Cynthia Irwin, describing her impressions of the site and hinting at its potential significance. Hannah Marie Wormington was one of the first scientists who came to view Armenta's collection. Wormington had always been a pioneer. When she began her studies in 1937, women were not yet allowed in the Department of Archaeology at Harvard. Undaunted, she sat outside on the steps of the lecture hall to take notes. Wormington began mentoring Irwin when Cynthia was a teenager. Cynthia's mother also had a strong interest in archaeology. Kay Irwin was an innovator in the casting of artifact reproductions. She specialized in adding the artistic touch of perfect color duplication when she recreated the flints, cherts, and other stone materials of the past. In the mid-1950s, Marie Wormington was writing her masterpiece, the fourth edition of Ancient Man in North America. Barely out of high school, Cynthia was entrusted with the index. The fourth edition was the first major synthesis of paleo research to include the new radiocarbon dating method. When it was published in 1957, it became the widely accepted foundation of a new scientific vision based on calculable time. To professionals and the public, she effectively communicated the idea that the record of paleo peoples in the New World began around 12,000 years ago. Wormington was optimistic that the new technologies would lead to further discovery. She knew that the Valsakillo site would require careful excavation, and her protege, Cynthia Irwin, was ready to lead the team. In 1962, Cynthia Irwin was one year shy of marriage and her Harvard PhD, and had already led several world-class digs. She was granted a permit from the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, known as the INAH. Along with Juan Armenta, she began her first field season at Hoyatlico, on the shores of the Valsuquillo Reservoir. She went down there for three years, 1962, 64, 66. She organized probably one of the first interdisciplinary archaeological expeditions, at least in Mexico, looking for early man in America during the Ice Age. Interdisciplinary means that it wasn't just an archaeologist going down looking for artifacts. She brought along Smithsonian paleontologists and geologists from the U.S. Geological Survey the tops in their field. The site, called Huayatlico, on the banks of the Valsequillo Reservoir, was once the channel of an ancient stream. Cynthia chose a spot to excavate not far from where Armenta had discovered the engraved bones. The site turned productive very quickly. Stone spear points were uncovered, and Cynthia's team began to carefully record the positions where the artifacts were found. So this is uh, Cynthia's trench wall. 
the sites that were chosen all were productive, all had artifacts, and all were associated with Ice Age animals. So it was an incredible beginning in 1962. Eventually it turned out to be one of the most controversial sites uh, that's been excavated, and one that uh, we have not resolved uh, the issues. Uh, the site is stratified. In other words, uh, younger stuff's at the top, and you just dig on down through lower stuff. And uh, these are casts of the artifacts, uh, starting up here with the upper Hyatt Lockwood Unit C is uh, uh, the youngest, and then this material down here from El Horno uh, is the oldest. And that makes perfectly good sense because this type of projectile point, it's bifacial, it's flaked on both sides, and it's bipointed. And to my way of thinking, this is an Asian style projectile point because it's very thick relative to its width and it's pointed at both ends. And we can follow this style of projectile point all the way back into Siberia. But we see these in South America starting around 12,000, between 13 and 12,000. And so to find this at roughly that same age in the Valley of Mexico makes perfectly good sense. One of the interesting parts about these spear points was that they did not have the customary flute that was essentially the earmark of Clovis points. So she knew she wasn't dealing with a Clovis culture here. Beneath the volcanic layer, called the Hoyatlico ash, are deposits of clay. Beneath those layers are beds C and E, where Irwin Williams found bifacial spear points and Ice Age animal bones. Beneath that was bed I, where the older unifacial spear points were found. So they started excavating down below, and then all of a sudden they started getting these very interesting flint artifacts. And these are projectile points that are unifacial. In other words, actually they're not even bifacial, they're just pieces of flint that have been shaped to a sharp point with these steep flakes coming all the way down here, all the way down there, and that's all they can do to make the artifact. And these were found with mammoth bones, with camels, with horse, uh, all kinds of animals that are now extinct. Cynthia personally excavated each artifact as it was found. The stratigraphy and the relative positions of the stone tools made sense to her. It is generally accepted that bifacial tools were more complex and the bifacial tradition more recent than simpler unifacial tools that would be found in the earlier, lower levels of geological time. This led her to conclude that she had perhaps technological evolution occurring at this site. She had excellent bifaces on top and she had unifaces on the bottom, all associated with extinct Ice Age animals. It couldn't have been better. The problem was dating. The bones were so fossilized, their organic materials had been replaced by minerals preventing C14 from being used on these bones. There just wasn't enough organic material left to date. Cynthia believed they needed to find another site away from the edges of the water where the bone might not have become fossilized as quickly. Hal Maldi of the United States Geological Survey was the project's geologist. Maldi had worked previously with Cynthia Irwin Williams at a site called Hell Gap in Wyoming and had looked for early man sites in China with Wormington in 1975 for the National Academy of Sciences. Because uh, neighboring volcanoes, uh, uh, both to the west and uh, to the north, that uh, there was a lot of volcanic material around and uh, I saw the need to extend the, the geologic investigation of the valley proper out onto these uh, volcanoes to see whether I could relate the uh, uh, volcanic events, the eruption materials, primarily volcanic ash, to things that we were finding out there in the valley. So in 1966, Hal Maldi, the geologist, found about three or four miles away 
stratigraphy in a deep wash called Kalapan. He found some stratigraphy or a layer of soil that he thought was of the same age and of the same nature as the materials they were digging out at the reservoir. What he found was a flake that may have been a scraper, some shell, and some organic materials in the soils. Using the carbon-14 dating method on the shell from Kalapan, a date of 22,000 years was derived. As radical as it seemed, the age of 22,000 years would eventually become one of the most conservative estimates for earlier humans at Valsequillo. As a matter of fact, if it's only 22,000 or 24,000, as she originally thought, that's really interesting too because it's totally different than anything we're getting to that age as well. And it is much older than anything we have in North America right now by at least 6,000 years. This young graduate student has found probably the earliest site in the New World. Was she right? Was she correct? How did she feel about this? She was nervous. If anything, Cynthia was extremely responsible as a scientist. She didn't want to go grandstanding and go blabbing to the news. In fact, we, we have a letter where she's writing to the director of the Peabody Museum, a Dr. Brew, where she doesn't want to go public with this yet. She's feeling very uneasy about these dates because of their great antiquity. Um, as a result of that letter, though, uh, Dr. Brew apparently went public with those dates and announced those dates. And this was uh, probably in 1966 or early 1967. Williams immediately knew that a 22,000-year date paralleled the oldest known spear points found in the Old World. This meant that if the spear points found at Hoyatlico were any lower in the strat column than Colopin, she would have to face the unthinkable, that she had found the oldest spear points ever discovered in the New World. As controversial as this date was, it was nothing compared with what was yet to come. The release of the 22,000-year date triggered an avalanche of unexpected events. At the height of Cynthia's most productive season, her work at Valsequillo came to an abrupt halt. Dr. Jose Luis Lorenzo, head archaeologist at Mexico's National Museum, published a bulletin accusing Irwin Williams of planting her discoveries. Then, according to eyewitnesses, Lorenzo visited the site and accompanied by armed federales, interrogated the workers, trying to elicit confessions that they planted the controversial spear points. Juan Armenta's daughter, Celine, remembers those days. The uh, scientific authorities sent some men with pistols to, to try to scare the workers at the field. And they were about 60 workers. But three of them uh, accepted that the fossils were planted and only these three people who signed the paper and saying, yes, we planted and the scientists planted the fossils. The other 50 and more uh, workers never accepted. They were very honest. Jose Lorenzo, who was the uh, Mexican archaeologist, uh, who's well known for his paleo-Indian work, of course, uh, I think was a little jealous that, uh, one, he didn't find that early stuff, two, that it was an American that found it, and three, it was an American woman that found it. And so he did everything he could to uh, discredit Cynthia and the work. And, uh, and Juan Armenta, to discredit Juan Armenta. And I think the work was good. I don't think she was directly accused of planting the artifacts herself. Instead, it may have been something much worse, that she was incompetent to realize that artifacts were being planted on her site. And this goes back to the logistics of planting. These sites were all 
on very hard sediments. They were not dirt like you usually see archaeologists digging in in your science films. This was almost like paleontology or geology in the sense that the material, if it wasn't rock, it was almost rock. They had to use picks and chisels rather than the trowel, which is the standard archaeological tool. Consider a sidewalk and you're trying to tell an archaeologist or you're trying to convince an archaeologist that something in that sidewalk has been planted. This means you've got to break open that sidewalk and try and cover it up and so that the archaeologist believes that what they're coming upon is something that hasn't seen the light of day for as long as it's been buried. Uh, having worked down there last year and experienced the density and the hardness of the sediments, <clears throat> both the, the Mexican archaeologists and myself agreed there's just no way you could plant artifacts in this material and hope to get away with it. Marie Warmington quickly moved to her protege's defense. In the fall, she organized a professional conference, essentially to defend Cynthia against the claims of fraud. The archaeological professionals closed ranks behind Cynthia, confirming the validity of her excavation work. As Dr. Stanford remembers, she was one of the, the greats in instituting new techniques, new scientific techniques for recovering the most minute detail. And this was one of the wonderful elements she brought to her profession and why she was so highly regarded for her entire life. They owned the artifacts. She was working under a permit that these artifacts belonged to uh, the Museo Nacional in Mexico City where they, some of them worked. And so when she left, she deposited these along with the bone at, at the museum. And when she went back to study them, they were all gone. And they've never been seen since. Now, fortunately for all of us, her mother was with her. And while she was in Mexico, she cast those artifacts before they were given back to the museum. And when she died, her collection came here. And so this is all that is left of that excavation, is what's these plastic artifacts in this box. So right now, uh, the, the important thing is Cynthia's now passed away, as uh, have the archaeologists in Mexico that were uh, basically jealous of, of her finding this real early stuff. And so now it's time to go back and, and reassess what actually went on there. In spite of the support Irwin Williams received from Wormington and her peers, the controversy about the artifacts was soon to escalate when new dating techniques were applied. In an attempt to accurately determine the dates, two geologists from the United States Geological Survey were brought in. Barney Zabo ran tests using uranium series dating, while Virginia Steen McIntyre examined zircon crystals using her expertise in tephrochronology. No one was prepared for the shock when Barney Zabo announced a uranium series age of 250,000 years old. At this point, Irwin Williams went from potentially making history for redating the arrival of man in the New World to facing dates that were so extreme she felt they could not be published at all. But more important, she was denied permission to ever work at the site again. Her official report was never completed. All of the artifacts have gone missing, and the site was closed to further investigation. The story of Irwin Williams and Armenta's historic discoveries has almost been forgotten as the memory of the scientific uproar of Valsequillo has faded away. Forty years have passed, and although many prominent archaeologists still believe that the Huayatlaco site contains important evidence, it took one man's vision and tenacity to reignite the investigation. So a native breakthrough site like Huayatlaco, which just jumps you back here, and then you've got to start rethinking and reconstructing everything. In 1997, George Carter, an archaeologist with a long career of investigating controversial cases, called upon his friend Marshall Payne to reopen the Valsequillo site 
and to underwrite a new series of field tests. And then they said, well, how'd you get interested in Way at Laco? I says, well, George Carter called me one time and asked me if I wouldn't look into that. <laughs> and he says, something like, what are you going to do next time? I says, I'm not answering the phone. <laughs> Historically, many of the great advances in American science have begun with the entrepreneurial dreams of financial patrons from outside the profession. For example, today's most widely held theory for the peopling of the new world across Beringia was advanced at the beginning of the 20th century by collaboration between science and private philanthropic support. Before the Russian Revolution closed the northern borders to scientific exchange, Franz Boas from the American Museum of Natural History launched teams of anthropological researchers into Alaska and Siberia. The expedition was underwritten by a New York financier by the name of Morris K. Jessup. Information from the famous Jessup expedition helped solidify the idea of cultural and biological connections between peoples across the North Pacific Rim. 100 years ago, Boaz's scientific vision, financed privately by Jessup, became a foundation block for the emerging hypothesis that the first Americans came from Siberia. This concept would eventually become the reigning paradigm. In 2001, a new archaeological expedition combining Mexican and U.S. scientists was organized to go to Valsequillo and reassess the results of Cynthia's earlier work. What I intended to do is to redo what was done many years ago by Cynthia Irwin Williams, but to use more modern techniques in the evaluation of what was done. Most scientists accepted that the artifacts were real. It was the age of the site that ultimately created the greatest controversy. The new research team devoted itself to reanalyzing the entire sequence of dating events, beginning with the first arguments against the Kalapan dates. There was a number of complaints when this 22,000-year-old date was published. It wasn't so much the date that was being criticized, but the fact that the date comes from a sedimentary or a soil profile miles away from the actual site. And there were some geologists that criticized the judgment that the Kalapan site from where the dates came from was actually the same stratigraphy from which the Ice Age animals with the artifacts were coming out of at Valsequillo Reservoir. And in fact, some geologists were pretty close to proving that these are two different layers, therefore bringing problems into that association. It's an indirect association. When you go to a site miles away and take a date out of a, uh, of a layer of soil and then try to associate that to another sediment, uh, sedimentary bed miles away, and especially in such a significant discovery as this. In 1968, a new and still experimental dating method was used directly on the bones that Cynthia found with the tools. Charles Naser, a dating specialist with the U.S. Geological Survey, joined the effort. The dating of this site started off when geologists working with anthropologists collected bones from large mammals that were associated in the same layer as the artifact tools. These were Bones were given to Barney Zabo at the USGS in Denver. He was involved with a technique called uranium series disequilibrium dating. As uranium decays by alpha emission, new daughter elements, such as thorium-234, are created. This process continues over time, with both elements accumulating. By measuring the amounts of the new daughter elements and comparing it to the amount of uranium that was present, an age can be calculated. Barney's ages were all in excess of about 100,000 years to in excess of several hundred thousand years. So we don't know what the top end on a lot of, of Barney's ages were, but we know that they were greater than, a, certainly greater than 100,000 years. So. This was uh, a bombshell. 
A hundred thousand years was far earlier than most scientists believe the first humans would have been capable of reaching the New World from Asia. The uranium dating of the bones was just the beginning of a series of tests using new dating techniques. In 1966, the project's geologist, Hal Maldi, had been joined by Virginia's Dean McIntyre. McIntyre was a young graduate student who specialized in the new technologies used to date layers of volcanic ash. The different layers of ash, or tephras, which could be seen as outcrops around the reservoir, were the result of different volcanic eruptions over time. The messy bears in business geology. The volcanic ashes at the site occur above the artifact layer. That means that they were deposited in geologic time more recently than the time that the gravels of the artifact bearing and bone bearing bed were deposited. They are, in fact, younger than the bone bearing, artifact bearing bed. If geologists could calculate the date of the volcanic eruption by analyzing the ash layer, they would then know that the tools found below the tephra were even older. McIntyre used an experimental dating method that calculated the trace elements of water trapped in crystals that formed with the ash. That's a piece of pumice. Lightweight, probably would float on water. Little tiny crystals in there are crystals that I work with. So small, they're smaller than grains of sand. Although her method at the time was very experimental, she too got an age in the range of 250,000 years, far too early for the accepted dates of humans in the New World. This led to further testing of the volcanic ash layers. So geologists again collected some volcanic ashes from layers that are in known relationship to the artifact bearing beds and they separated a mineral called zircon from these beds and gave me the little tiny crystals size of grains of sand to date with the fission track technique. Fission track dating relies on a very rare event that happens to uranium atoms. When a volcano erupts, it forms zircon crystals and volcanic glass in which are trapped uranium-238 atoms. The uranium spontaneously decays, releasing energy when splitting into two roughly equal nuclei. These highly charged particles repel each other and shoot off in opposite directions with great force. This leaves behind damaged scars or fission tracks in the mineral. Because the radioactive decay occurs at a known rate, the density of fission tracks can be compared to the amount of uranium within a mineral grain to determine its age. My ages came out on two different samples of about 400,000 years and about 600,000 years. These ages had very large errors, uh, which means they could have been anywhere between probably 200,000 and 800,000. They could not have been 10,000 or 15,000. That's, there was just too much uh, antiquity in the grains to allow them to be that, uh, that young. What happened to these findings of yours? It just appears that it just went off into a black hole. The data never ever gets cited. Uh, nobody ever talks to me about it. Uh, it's just as if we had never done it. Well, we have it in Cynthia's own writing that those radical dates are not to be used because they're too young and too unreliable. What would be your comment? At the time that they were, that this work was begun, they were relatively new. But they had been well tested in the geological literature and geologists accepted their results as valid. So how surprising is this, Chuck? Didn't you tell me that you were involved in the Olduvai uh, discoveries in uh, Africa with your dating? About the same time, I was, uh, got involved with dating zircons from the Olduvai site. 
The old device site itself was controversial at the, at, in the late 60s. Early potassium argon work suggested that this site had an age of on the order of two million years, which was quite a bit older than the prevailing thoughts. This site, these ages were disputed in the archaeological, anthropological literature. Uh, at that time, some zircons were sent to Bob Fleischer at the Schenectady General Electric Lab, who dated zircons from volcanic ashes, similar to what we were doing in Mexico, at the Old Dubai site. And he got, actually, I think it was glass, excuse me, he dated glass from that site and got ages on the order of two million, which is 